We greet all of you tonight in Christ's name and express our thanksgiving for your presence. Greeting our brethren in the live stream also. <coughs> I'd like to draw your attention before I begin to our prayer requests that we had. I trust you didn't miss this, that in all three of these we were talking about something God made us make. He make us to increase and abound, make us perfect, make his people perfect. To me, it's so wonderful to be able to pray that kind of a prayer, <clears throat> not out of a sense of obligation, but knowing that God can indeed make these things happen. Amen. This will be our ninth message. On the second coming of Christ, we've only got 31 more to go. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the things that has allowed people to distort the doctrine of Christ's second coming, often treated it as a theory, because they've not been able to integrate it with godly living. In other words, it's impractical. But it is integrated with God in living. No matter what a person says or professes, if they're not godly, they don't believe Jesus is coming again. Amen. They're not trusted in that. They've not been convinced of that. They're not persuaded of that. That's why they're ungodly, Amen. among other things. Now, thus far, we've seen that the coming of Christ is associated with, like, teaching sound doctrine. It's associated with things that are certain or sure. It's associated with being prepared or ready. And we've seen that the coming of the Lord pertains to him personally. It's the coming of the Lord. That's, that's what we're talking about here. The day or the hour that he's coming is not known to Jesus himself, not because he's unlearned or unwise, but because he has volunteered to forfeit this recollection so he can fellowship with us in expectation. Now we'll see that the second coming of Christ is directly related to the matter of obedience and, and obeying and doing the commandments of God. Again, our text is, I give thee charge in the sight of God, we're talking about something serious now, Amen. who quickens all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, here's what I'm going to charge you, Timothy, and what I charge you, keep this commandment. Without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that's pretty plain. You don't have to have a lesson in English to understand what that says. Keep the commandment without spot. Not try and keep the commandment. That's, that's, that's not what it says. It doesn't say do your best to keep the commandment. It's not what it says. You're to keep it without spot. Not keep it on Monday, forget it about it on Tuesday, and so forth. Because Jesus, after all, the scriptures reveal that Jesus is going to present to himself a glorious church not having spot. That's Ephesians 5.27. And I will tell you, a church that's spotted now will not be spotless then. Amen. You may settle, settle that in your heart. That's just the way it is. Say, nobody gave me without spot. Well, this is the Lord that said this. Amen. 
And he's given you some secrets on how to be without spots, so it's your business to find out what they are and keep them. And we're not going to spell everything out for you like your little children. Peter said, 2 Peter 3.14, Wherefore, beloved, seeing we look for such things, which was the coming of the Lord and the consummation of the ages, be diligent that ye may be found in him in peace without spot. That's when he comes, you're without spot. Not when he, when he comes then, at that last, you'll be able to be without spot. That's not what it says. If there's something you need to be forgiven of, get it settled today before you go to sleep. Amen. Don't live with it another minute. Amen. There's provision for you to be without spot. Amen. There's provision to be cleansed. Washed, there's provision for that. But see, part-time Christians can't do this. People that aren't devoted can't do this. People that are on today, off tomorrow can't do this. They can't maintain a state of spotlessness because they're too far from the Lord. They're too unaware of spiritual things. They're too ignorant of the things of God. They can't, they can't do what there's full provision to do. Without spot. And unrebukable. <laughs> you know, we're talking about heavy things here. This is not that I won't rebuke you. I mean, we can find things that we can rebuke one another about it properly. But that's not what we're talking about here. This is God without unrebukable. This isn't the only place this is mentioned. Philippians 2.15 says that you may be blameless and harmless as sons of God without rebuke. That's what God wants for his church now. The sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights. So if you could be easily rebuked by God tonight for this or for that, Settle it tonight before the Lord. Get the rebuke. Have done with it. Confess your sin. Make some commitment to God that makes some sense. And be with it. Because believe me, whoever's not found when Jesus comes without rebuke, now it's questionable whether they're going to be received. Else I can't see the sense of this being in Scripture. Without rebuke, God's made provision for this. God's made provision for you to be in a condition where even he, with all of his knowledge, will not rebuke you. Yeah. Colossians 1.22 says that Jesus in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unbelievable and unreprovable in his sight. That's why Jesus died. See, Jesus loved us and gave himself for us. That's true. Jesus loved us and died for us. That's true. But you don't hear people say Jesus loved us so we wouldn't be reprovable. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's something else. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's true, just the same. Jude, the Lord's half-brother, said, Now to him who is able to keep, your, keep you from falling and present you faultless, present you how? Faultless. Before, it, before his presence, before his glory, with exceeding, the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. So that's what salvation is calculated to do. Any other salvation, any salvation as presented that eliminates this factor here, this is a bogus salvation. This is not a true message. People shouldn't listen to it. They should just stand up and walk out. If somebody starts preaching things like this, because it'll contaminate you. At your weakest hour, Satan come on and convince you that some of this stuff is true. And move people to overlook their own iniquity and not deal with it. Yeah. See, when we sin and we we're not saying we don't sin, we're saying when we do, we do something about it. Amen. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, that's a commitment from God. Amen. So keep this commandment I've given you. Keep this commandment without spot and unrebukable. 
Well, I, I hate to say it, but it, that eliminates a lot of people. See, this teaches us that the, the recollection of something untrue will not contribute to purity and obedience. Mm -hmm. Here he's telling you to, re telling you to, recall, to recall the coming of the Lord, and that will contribute to you being pure. Mm -hmm. yeah. But a false doctrine about Christ's second coming will not help anybody be pure. That's right. yeah. It'll not contribute to anybody's obedience. Well, you'll be told it does. You'll be told it will. I read Left Behind, and it changed my life. Hogwash. These people have either lied or been deceived. God doesn't quicken people and make people conscious of their need by things that are not true. Amen. Amen. Satan authors the lie. That doctrine of the rapture and so forth, if that doctrine is not true, nobody had better connect that with God. Yes, no one had better connect that with Jesus, who himself is the truth, yes. or with the Holy Spirit, who's the spirit of truth. God will not perfect a person through improper doctrine. Yes, Amen. This, this will not happen. I think in our hearts, people know this pretty well, but... That's not how the church world is proceeding. Keep this commandment. He said, well, let's look at what the commandment is. That'd be, that'd be, that'd be important. What, what, what is it? Keep this commandment. What, what commandment is he talking about? Well, here it is in the 12th verse of the same chapter. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called and professed a good profession before many witnesses. That's, that's the commandment. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. That's the commandment. Fight. Don't be a sluggard now. Don't be backing off. Don't be doing this. Don't withdraw from the battle momentarily so you can kind of pamper yourself. Fight the good fight of faith. Yeah. Get hold of eternal life. Yeah. That is, be sure of eternal life. Yeah. Have a grasp on it and know you have it. That's the commandment. Yeah. Fight the good fight of faith. Let's, let's look at that briefly. What's it mean to fight the good fight of faith? Well, you've got to fight to keep it. Yeah. Uh -huh. And you have to fight to express it. This is how salvation is set up, brothers and sisters. That's right. It's set up so that faith doesn't mean anything if there's not a battle. Yeah. Amen. Faith is intended to work in the midst of conflict, yeah. Amen. opposed by the adversary, wrestling against principalities and powers, See? being tempted. Faith faith's intended to work in that kind of environment. Yeah. So what has a person done if they say, let's escape to the mountain up there and we'll be safe? Satan knows how to get up on mountains. That's right. Jesus was tempted to the mountain. Yep. High place. Fight the good fight of faith. Here it is, 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Stand fast in the faith. Which means the battle is designed to lodge, dislodge you. Yeah. Uh -huh. Move you to the right or move you to the left. Or get you in a stance where God won't hear you. That's what Satan says. Get you in a stance where the world looks better. Stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. We've got too many spiritual sissies. They're all the time crying. All the time complaining because things aren't going well. Sissies. They're not men. They're babies. We can tolerate that for a while. But there comes a time you have to stand fast and quit like a man, and you may be a teenage boy like David, but you still have to quit like a man. Amen. Amen. That's keeping the faith, fighting the faith. That's fighting the good fight of faith. Here's another aspect of fighting the good fight of faith. 
Examine yourselves to see whether ye be in the faith. Are you in the faith? That is, think of faith as a, an arena of activity. The arena in which you fight the good fight of faith. The arena in which victory. You overcome the world in this arena in the faith. You, you obtain the promises of God in this. Are you in the faith? Are you in a position where you can, where you can receive from God? You think everybody can receive from God? Well, they can't. Yeah, that's right. Everybody can't. You got to be where the blessings are distributed. Amen. On the day of Pentecost, if they want God, prom Jesus promised them the Holy Spirit would come. They had to be where they were supposed to be right. when this happened. They they couldn't collect down in Samaria right. yeah. and expect something to happen down there. Amen. They, could, they couldn't uh, go to Bethsaida because they had a nice house there to gather in, wait in, Be in Bethsaida. They had to go to Jerusalem. Amen. He says, stay in Jerusalem. Amen. All right, examine yourself to be, whether you're in the faith, it's like, are you in Jerusalem? Yeah. Are you in the area where God has promised to? Mm -hmm. That's involved in fighting the good fight of faith. Here's another, Philippians 127. We talk about what it means to fight the good fight of faith. Let your conversation, or that's the way you live, the manner of life, be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. When people look at you, they say, ah, there's the gospel being lived out. There it is being lived out. There, now there's somebody that believes the gospel. Let your life be as becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs. I say, I may hear of your affairs. I don't know of any church where I've ever heard of their affairs. Yeah. Well, I have heard of some affairs, but they weren't the kind that I'd like to hear about. Yeah. You stop and think now, how, right. how, many churches have you, how many churches have you heard of their affairs? Yeah. Or individuals, you've heard of their affairs. Yeah. Their affairs in Christ. Let your conversation be as become with the gospel of Christ, whether I come and see you or else be absent. I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit. Here it is. Here's the body talk now. Striving together for the faith of the gospel or the results from hearing the gospel. Striving. Now, I, I realize some people don't want to strive with us. We're not going to quit striving Amen. because of that. We're going to strive. We're just, if we were just left with a handful, we'd keep on striving. Amen. Amen. Striving yeah. together mm -hmm. for the faith. Yeah, right. There's something about being together for the right reason in the right place Amen. that strengthens your faith. Amen. Haven't you found it to be so? We talk about this quite yeah. often. Uh -huh. Amen. That's part of fighting the good fight of faith. Here's to something else that's involved, Colossians 1.23. If you continue a blessing, if you continue in the faith, grounded yeah. and settled, mm -hmm. and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, like exactly who do you know that you that, that fits, that describes them? Yeah. Who do you know? By thinking out in your thinking names. It probably won't take you long to go through the list. People who are continuing in the faith, there's they still believe in, they're grounded, yeah. they're settled, mm -hmm. they've not been moved away from the hope of the gospel, still looking forward. What is that? That's fighting the good fight of faith. That's, yeah. that's what that is. And here's another perspective of fighting the good fight of faith, 1 Timothy 3, 9, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Mm -hmm. And there is something about faith that is mysterious. You can't uh, explain it on the level of rationality. Like, I, I know the chair will hold me up, so I'll sit on the chair. You know, really? Don't insult us mm -hmm. with those kind of babyfied expressions. They're unbefitting for the people of God. Well, I believe I'm going to get a paycheck, so I work, because I... That's not at all faith. Mm -hmm. That's not faith at all. Yeah. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the th 
the evidence of things not seen. That's right. Amen. Hold the mystery of the faith. That is, even though there are things about it you can't explain like you'd like to, you can still keep it. Yeah, you can still keep it. You may not be able to explain fully in intellectual terms how the Jesus and God are one and how you've been joined to them in our one spirit. And all right, language may, but you can hold that mystery. Amen. But it's got to be in a pure conscience. Yes, yeah. Your conscience can't be hounding you about the past. Yeah. That's part of fighting the good fight of faith. See, it's keeping your conscience in good, healthy Amen. shape. In Titus 1.13, it mentions another aspect of fighting the good fight of faith. Rebuke them sharply. He just got this saying, uh, all Christians are liars. Some of their own poets said all Christians are liars. So I said, this witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply. Rebuke them how? Sharply, sharply, sharply. Rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Uh -huh. There are some people you really can't be really gentle. You have to be sharp. Because they're, they're kind of dull in their minds and spirits. They're kind of dull. And it takes a kind of a, mm -hmm. make it hard for them to kick against the goads. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's people like this. They buke them sharply. They might be sound in the faith. What sound in the faith means? means they're fighting the good fight of faith. We want people to be to the point where they don't have to have their hand held all the time. Yeah, amen. Where you can depend when we're not together, they're still fighting. One more about Satan. Walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Whom he may. Who may he? Well, those who God allows him to be and those who are in his territory. So the Lord, it's like the Lord says, listen, Satan, whoever wanders around and ends up in your territory, I mean, you know, work them over. Work them over. They didn't have enough sense to stay where I put them. Just lay it on them. You can't take their life, though. Uh -huh. Home resist, steadfast in the faith, knowing the same afflictions are accomplishing your brethren there in the world. I've been having, I've been having a lot of, so what? Uh -huh. So you've been having a lot of trials. What about your other brethren in the world? Their brethren have been having a lot harder trials than we've been having. Amen. So let's be steadfast in the faith. That's, a, that's fighting the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. See, we say this because faith, you can depart from the faith. That's 1 Timothy 4.1. And you will if you don't fight to keep it. Amen. See, I'm discouraged right now. I'm going to go to bed. I got to get away from everybody. All right, I can understand a little bit of that, but I recommend fighting yeah. instead of retreating. That's right. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, because some have departed. First Timothy five eight says that some have denied the faith, has rejected, just just rejected the faith. Yeah. Another place in 1 Timothy 6.10, Paul speaks, the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, yeah, they wanted to be rich, they wanted a lot of money, they've erred from the faith. Oh, you could err. You could get off the path. Yeah, yeah that's why we're told to fight the good fight of faith. That's the commandment, because you can err from the faith. And then faith, 2 Timothy 2.18 says the faith of some's overthrown. Some false prophet comes along and actually overthrows someone's faith. We yeah. say, but the faith, I thought faith is a victory to overcome the world. Yep, yeah, that's if you fight the good fight of faith. That's right. yeah. So that's the commandment, that's the commandment now. Fight the good fight of faith. And lay hold on eternal life. Know you possess it. 
and don't quit until you know. So to help you, this is eternal life, eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So you have, you know, you're familiar with God. You know his ways. You can say to yourself, I know, I know God doesn't approve of this. Or I know this is something God wants me to do. Well, all right, when you have that response, like, what do you do? Do you follow through with it or do you let it drop? Lay hold on eternal life. It's more than just cerebral. Mm -hmm. Titus 3, 7 says, Being justified by his grace, we should be heirs, made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So laying hold of eternal life involves having a hope or a confidence of where you're going to end up. That there's a better place mm -hmm. and you're calling it home. Mm -hmm. It's a better country. <laughs> and we're seeking after it. Yeah. It's a city that has foundations whose builder and maker is God. And I'm sorry, you can't impress me with a city in the world because I got a better city. Amen. You laying hold on eternal life is knowing this. Yeah. Laying hold of eternal life. This is the record God has given us eternal life. This is the record now. This is what's yeah. written down. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Yeah. Lay hold of that. John said, these things, I'm writing these things unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you might know, you may know you have eternal life. Well, there's a lot of professing Christians, they don't know they have eternal life. This doesn't mean you teach people to say, I have eternal life. This, it, knowing you have eternal life means you can live with this to your advantage. Move forward. In Christ Jesus. And we know the Son of God has come, 1 John 5, 20 says, We know the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding that we might know him that is true, and we're in him that is true. This is the true God and eternal life. Yeah. This is eternal life, knowing, lay hold of that. Yeah. And Jude said, Jude 1, 21, Keep yourselves in the love of God looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. See, I thought God loved me all the time. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, let's be honest about this. That If God's love was unvarying mm -hmm. and there was no possibility that it would ever depart, how, what sense does it make to keep yourself in it? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Keep your, don't do anything that will provoke God. Mm -hmm. Bless God by your life. Yeah. Bless God by the way you think. And bless God by the way you do things. That's part of fighting the good fight of faith. See, Fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. This is the charge now. Yeah. And do this, quote, in the sight of God. Oh, <laughs> uh, Not in the sight of the church. Not in the, not in the sight of me. In the sight of God do this consciously under the watchful eye of God. It's one thing for the doctrine to say God knows what we are, where we are and God knows who we are and God knows all of that. That's true. Uh -huh. But you have to live in the awareness of that. That's right. uh -huh. It's part of the commandment now. 2 Corinthians 2.17 Paul said, We are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. We talk, we preach, we speak, Paul says, knowing that God is looking yeah, right. and listening. Yeah, now, this would change many a sermon. Yeah. Oh, and such a, there's a lot of sermons never would be preached mm -hmm. if this was known. Yeah. It's part of the commandment now that we've been given in the sight of God. Galatians 3.11 says that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just to live by faith. See, the whole, the whole of spiritual life is in the sight of God. Not theoretically in the sight of God like this. This is... Uh, 
like learning a catechism. Said then the this is you live in this awareness. God sees this. God sees what what I'm doing. God hears what I'm saying. God comprehends what I'm thinking in the sight of God. That's part of fighting the good fight of faith. Now I'm laying hold of eternal life in the sight of God. First Thessalonians 1 3, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God our Father. See, you've been living in the sight of God. Now that's a sort of a spiritual art. But it's something you want to develop in culture. To be able to live with an awareness that God, the eye of the Lord, is upon his people. Amen. He knows what's in the heart. He knows what's in the mind. He knows where you're at. He knows who you are. He knows what you're thinking. Now, that just doesn't have to be a threat to those that are on the bad side. That's a blessing to those that are on the good side. There may be nobody in the world that appreciates what, who you are or where you're at except God. Yeah, that's right. Amen. That's sufficient, though. To, that's sufficient to enable you to fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. Now, this is the God that quickens all things, he adds. In the sight of God who quickens all things, makes all things alive. Jesus said this, as the Father raises up the dead and quickens them, even so the Son quickens, quickens or makes alive whom he will. Whoever, whoever Jesus wants to make alive, he does. Yeah. If it's a young girl who's just died, he can make her alive. Amen. If it's a young man that died and a couple of days have passed and we're in a funeral procession, makes him alive. Yeah. If it's Lazarus who's been in the grave for four days and stinks, as mortification said, he makes him alive. Right. See, there's people that are like Jairus' daughter. They look good. There's still sort of a beauty about them. But they're dead. But they've managed to... <laughs> There's other people that are like the widow of Nain's son. Eh? They're not quite... Uh, so beautiful. They've been dead for a couple of days. Eh? You don't snap pictures of them. Then there's Lazarus. I mean... <laughs> but all three of them are dead. Dead's dead. You can't be more dead. You're yeah. dead's dead. It's a state you're in. So there's God quickens the dead. Some that look good but aren't, he can make them alive. Some that kind of look good but aren't, he can make them alive. Some that just frankly stink, he can make them alive. Amen. God. See, you can fight the good fight of faith and lay hold of eternal life if you know you got a God like that That's right. behind you. Quickens the dead. Not only that, but it's before Jesus Christ who quickens the dead. Before Jesus Christ. So God does everything with Jesus in mind. God doesn't do it just for you. Amen. Jesus stands between you and God, and Jesus does everything for Jesus' sake. That's right. yeah. Then it comes to you That's it. after that. Amen. Jesus said in Revelation 1, 5, from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his fathers. He, he stands between you and God. Yeah. And if you're in a suitable relationship to Christ, what comes from God will get to you. Amen. That's, how, Amen. that's wonderful. And who, what Jesus are we talking about? We're talking about the Jesus that witnessed a good confession before Pontius Pilate. See, he's spelling it out for, for Timothy. You remember the occasions when he witnessed a good confession before Pontius Pilate? Here it is in John 18, 36 and 37. Jesus didn't back off. His life is on the line, so to speak. He didn't beg off. He said, my kingdom's not of this world. My, if my kingdom were of this world, then my servants fight yeah. that I should not be delivered to the Jews. What did he mean? He meant if my servants fought, they would win. Yeah, that's right. yeah. Yeah. If my kingdom was of this world, I would never have been arrested. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. And no bad had ever happened to you. 
Not of Jesus' kingdom was of this world. You wouldn't have been tested like you have been. You wouldn't have endured what you have endured. Things have, wouldn't have happened to you that did if his kingdom was of this world. But his kingdom's not of this world. This is the Jesus now we're talking about. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest I'm a king. And as it come out of your mouth, you couldn't help but say this because I am a king. To this end was I born. Not to this end I'm coming back a second time. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. He's not coming back to reign. That's He's right. born to be king. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness of the truth. He's a king of the truth. Mm -hmm. Everyone that's of the truth, well, maybe that's a little strong. <laughs> Maybe you ought to modify that. Maybe some of the tra other translations could water that down for us. Everyone who is of the truth yes, hears my voice. Yes, right. So what about those that don't hear his voice? They're not of the truth. That's right. If they say they are, they're just, they just lied. Mm -hmm. All right, now here's the, here's the commandment. Keep, keep the commandment mm -hmm. without spot and unrebukable, until the appearing, yeah. until the, up, not until the rapture, until the appearing. That's right. Amen. See, an appearing is not a rapture, That's right. as ordinarily conceived. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. As the rapture is taught in secret, but this is an appearing. That's right. yeah. Until, if you could make it until then, you're in. Now, who is, who, is, who is it that's going to appear? Well, uh, God has spelled this out in 1 Timothy 6.15. Who's going to appear? And this is, this is the one who's going to appear in these capacities. He's going to appear. He's the blessed and only potentate. He's the only one that's got all the power. Now, keep, keep the commandment now without spot and unrebukable, until this becomes evident to every person that's ever been born. Yeah. Till the assembled universe yeah. sees Jesus and there's no question at all about him being the one and only potentate. Mm -hmm. Keep the commandment yeah. until then. Yeah. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That's who he is, that's, and that's how he's going to be made known. He's not going to, he's not going to sneak back, sneak us out, and go back to heaven with us, wait a thousand years, and come back. That's right. I'm, so, I'm sorry. I can't respect people that think that. Uh -huh. Oh, I give them respect because they're the offspring of God. Uh -huh. but that's the only respect they're going to get from me. I'm sorry. I can't respect someone that, doesn't see Jesus this way. Because this is the way he is. This is how God's going to show him who is the one and only potentate. Not who shall be. Who is. Amen. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. So there may be people over you that you are subservient to that are scoundrels and they're not godly people. But Jesus is their Lord. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. And when it's necessary to do something mm -hmm. about their, this condition in order to favor you, he'll do it. Amen. Amen. And keep the commandment until he's made known like that. And he's the only one that has immortality. Mm -hmm. right. We will put on immortality. He is immortality. Amen. Amen. He's the only one who has it. That is, he's the only one who can confer it. Yeah. And he, he is going to confer it. Well, until that time comes when he confers immortality, until that time, mm -hmm. keep the commandment yeah. with that coming in mind. And he dwells in unapproachable light. Mm -hmm. All right, so for the carnal person, that means this is not a relevant matter. Because you can't approach it, so it must not be for us. Yeah. Oh, you don't want to think that way. Because everybody, he's going to bring the light to us. Yeah. And he's going to envelop the whole, for lack of a better term, the whole cosmos. 
He's going to illuminate everything. When he does, the temporal order is going to fall away. Right. Won't be able to survive it. Amen. When's that going to be? I don't know, but keep the commandment yeah. Amen. until then. That's right. Amen. <laughs> until then. No man has seen him glorified, nor can see him. That's, that's the one. That's the only way he's going to show himself again is as a glorified Christ. He disguised his glory. Even after he rose from the dead, he appeared in another form. You know, it wasn't, they didn't see Jesus as he really was. He accommodated himself to their frailty. When he comes again, he's not going to accommodate himself. He's not going to come down and say, I'm not, I'll sit on a throne in Jerusalem. You can come and visit me. And then I'm going to marshal the forces and fight a war. See, this is the glorified Christ we're talking about. There, an enemy can't even exist in the presence of a glorified Christ, Amen. much less fight. These are matters that uh, we can't be wrong or indifferent about. Keep the commandment until then. Fighting the good fight of faith, laying hold of the eternal life, and everything that involves, and every, I say and everything that involves, Engage in this. Do it. Mm -hmm. If you've been like a little haphazard about this, or maybe you've been like a part-time Christian, you haven't really been serious about this. All right, the Lord rebuke you for being that way, but now you can, now you can stop. Yeah. Amen. Just as surely as the people that murdered Jesus, uh -huh. just as surely as in the just a few moments of time, yeah. that whole thing could be changed. And it was. Mm -hmm. So your situation can be too. We, and this is the message we have for Amen. all people, particularly church people. We tell them, look, we got this mandate from God to fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life, get a firm grasp on it, keep on doing that. Not until it doesn't say fight the good fight of faith until you win, or lay hold on eternal life and then you'll have it. That's not what he says. Yeah, that's right. He says fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life until yeah, uh -huh. the Lord appears, Amen. and then that aspect of spiritual life will be will be done with it then, yeah. and we'll say I got a sword here, but I tell you what, I'm going to beat this thing into a plowshare. And I'm not going to study war anymore. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we have before us, brethren. Be of good cheer. Brother Aaron will have our exhortation tonight.